From the crossroads of America in the Hoosier state of Indiana, this is Get In, the podcast focused on the unfolding stories and extraordinary innovations happening right now in the heartland. I'm Matt Hunkler, CEO at Powder Keg, and I'll be one of your hosts for today's conversation. I'm joined in studio by co-host Nate Spangle, head of community at Powder Keg. And on the show today is Amy Brown, founder and CEO of Authentics. Like people had t- said, hey, you're gonna raise, raise venture capital. I had no idea what they were talking about. I didn't know that it was gonna be a thing for me. I really didn't. Amy Brown is the founder and CEO of Authentics, a machine learning software that analyzes millions of conversations to find tendencies and trends that healthcare organizations use to make educated decisions. The business has raised more than $28 million, has more than 100 employees or authentizens, and is growing like crazy. We are excited to have her on the show today to hear her story and learn from the growth and challenges that she has faced not only as a successful startup entrepreneur, but also a successful mom. Amy, welcome to Get In. Thank you. It's so awesome to be here. It's awesome. It's awesome to have you here today. And I'm so excited to talk because your team has been growing like crazy. Uh, I have so many friends who have joined the team recently and they all say great things. Um, I I would love to just learn a little bit more about you personally first. Um, uh, Did you get exposed to entrepreneurship at an early age? Uh, Have you always been entrepreneurial? When I was growing up, my dad is was a physician, my mom a teacher. However, they grew up farm kids, and there's just something about that farm agricultural upbringing that shows up no matter what career path you take, and at a very young age, just that ingenuity, hard work, sweat, <laughs> all of that, I was exposed to really young. And then in my early 20s, right when I became a mom for the first time, I got a, an idea for a product, a baby product. And while I had a career that I was passionate about, I ended up creating this side hu- hustle of yes. this baby product and was able to actually bring it all the way to market and sell it into a big box retailer. And that was really my foray into trying out entrepreneurial ships. But I heard that you were an entrepreneur at age five. Oh, oh. <laughs> my mom tell would tell story. you that. <laughs> yeah, my mom would tell you that. <laughs> we were on a family vacation. It was on a beach and I apparently was spending an afternoon coloring pictures and I got the idea to go out on the beach during the sunset and try to sell my my drawings for a nickel. And it was so funny because when people are out running on the beach, they do not have any money. (laughs) So I didn't make very many sales, but my mom said at the time that she knew I'd be okay after that. (laughs) Okay, so a lot to unpack there. First thing I want to ask, both of your parents grew up on farms. Where at? Yes, so in Owen County, which is southwest of Indy, and there's a little tiny town called Gosport, and that is where they both grew up. And all four of my grandparents grew up there. Yes. So it's a, a deep history in so rural cool. Indiana. Amazing. And then we gotta, we have to dive into this side hustle that you grew and got into a box retailer. I, I think that's where I want to hear about finding out, doing this while you were employed full time. What was your job at the time? At the time, I think I had a role or of a vice president of government programs for a managed care company. And when I started going back to work after maternity leave, I was looking for this product that I wanted for my baby. And I couldn't find exactly what I wanted. And so I just started coming up with this idea and developing a prototype. And I was involved in a an executive coaching network. And I was talking about my idea. And someone said, I could help you produce that. And so one thing just led to the other. And I just kept pursuing it and seeing where it would go. Oh my God. So what, what was the product? Yeah. Can you give us yeah, the pitch? We... Yeah. It's called Nolables okay. and uh, named after uh, my first child's name is Nola, but it also, it's, it's a replacement for traditional labels. So Nolables is, is a two part name oh, that's and they, they are a wrappable, snappable design label that can be machine washed and reused and it's also that you can keep updating your information on your labels without it getting dirty and messy and I learned about manufacturing in China I learned about just 
logistics, what it takes to get into a big box retailer. I was able to get a celebrity endorsement from, uh, her name is Tori Spelling. I don't know. Oh, if yeah. She's a 90s. Uh, yeah, what um, was she in? She had her big hit in 90210, which was That's popular right. when I was yes. growing up. But then she got into reality TV, was very much known as a mom, mompreneur type person. And so I actually, That's Stella, uh, my daughter Stella was five months old and we went out on and were filmed on in her reality what? show and all that good stuff. So you can have fun on YouTube trying to find the little snippet oh, I'm yes. in. <laughs> yes. We'll see if we can find that B-roll for the TikToks <laughs> later. Absolutely. What happened to Knowables? So, uh, you know, it just was a massive investment of, of not only time, but my own personal money. And I got to a stage where it could either, I could keep pouring and try to make it a thing or not. And I just decided I wasn't passionate enough about mm. that type of product to leave my career for it. But still that entrepreneurial spark had been lit. And so it was a several years later that I found the thing that I was most passionate about making the big leap for. I love that. And what did you learn during that time of growing a, a side hustle while also having a full-time job? Oh gosh, it was so great to learn about an entirely different industry. And it, you, you, you develop some muscles that you, maybe you're not using in your current career. And it just having perspective is doing things that require you to get uncomfortable and have a different perspective on life, on industry, whatever, is just, it's so valuable. And I learned a lot about myself and what I could do. And I learned a lot about my passion for inventing. And it was really good for me. I don't have any regrets, even though the business ultimately didn't make it, it, it taught me so much that really has uh, served me. Was there one struggle that you got through during that particular venture that you feel like grew you mm. more than others? Yeah, I think in that business, I learned a lot about the type of customer that I do well with. In that particular business, I was serving a consumer population. And it was really humbling to go to trade shows with my little product and have moms who are in my demographic <laughs> critiquing and criticizing and just like dealing with rejection and, and dealing with people saying your product isn't good enough or whatever. It's really good. It's good uh, character building. <laughs> Do you think it's important that entrepreneurs can deal with rejection? It has to be, a, it's a requirement, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely that. Like you just, there are times when, you know, you are so convicted about what you're doing. You are so passionate and you believe, and yet you can't force others to believe. You have to just continually hone your craft, your message, and hope that the timing, you know, of your message and the receiver are aligned. And you, you mentioned the spark was lit after that first venture, which of course we love here at Powder Keg, hearing that the spark was lit. What what was that venture seven years later? I'm, I'm assuming it was Authentics. It was Authentics, yeah. So I had a couple of different roles after Nullables um, that gave me more experience that I, I didn't know at the time I needed before starting Authentics. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I got to do more leadership in healthcare, which gave me more and more exposure to the problem that ultimately became like the passion that fueled the starting of Authentics. And so I'm really glad. Sometimes you look at the things that happen in your life that you wanted to have be successful. And at the time you're like, why didn't this go my way? And that's how I felt about Nullables. But then you look back 10 years later and you're like, oh, it's because <laughs> I was preparing for something else. And that's how I see it. Talk to us about the problem that you were seeing. Yeah. So as in the healthcare setting, I always had operations roles, which often meant I was leading the teams of people who were talking to customers every day. And in healthcare organizations and many industry organizations, there's large contact centers where they're talking to mass populations of consumers. And that was my role is to lead those teams. And I was just blown away, first of all, by the amount of data we were producing every day in the form of conversations. We were recording customer conversations as chat and text became a thing. We were, we were maintaining that data and we literally did nothing with it. It just sat in storage 
And it was this unstructured, messy data that was hard to organize, hard to find what you wanted, and it just sat in a storage closet. And that was one thing I was blown away by. The second was that we had sales, marketing strategy, C-suite, all uh, on one side of the house, like developing a go-to-market approach and trying to figure out like what customers wanted. And then in my side of the house, we had all this insight about what customers wanted because they tell us all day, every day in these conversations. And there was no bridge between the two. And that's really the problem that I became most passionate about solving is creating a bridge for voices that are pretty much lying dormant that could add massive value to the overall, not only the healthcare business, but the outcomes that we're all trying to achieve for patients. And I really started Authentics with this idea of resurfacing those voices and organizing them and telling a story at the macro level and also at the micro level that helped leaders know how to be responsive to their customer population. That's such a cool problem to be working on. And I'm curious what kind of, A, tipped you over the edge to start taking action and what were those first steps that you took to take action, chasing that idea down versus just leaving it as an idea? Yeah, I had been, this idea had been percolating in my brain for many months. And as time grew, I just couldn't unthink about it anymore. It was just Mm -hmm. was very present in my brain. And so I started to imagine doing it, imagine taking the leap and starting to have conversations with my husband and people in my close network about what it would really be like to take a big risk. At the time, I was the single income earner because my husband, we had decided he was going to be a stay-at-home dad. And so I was the only source of income and insurance. And so taking the risk felt really big. And some would say, rightfully so, irresponsible. (laughs) I had four children. Stella was only three years old. So she's my youngest. And, you know, it, it, it obviously was a, a really significant financial consideration. But what ultimately led to the decision was just honestly, it, it just felt like a calling, like I could not do it. And it just was so present and I had the support of my family. And so we had conversations at the dinner table about the lifestyle changes we would need to make and started rearranging our financial and spending picture. And and one day I turned in my letter of resignation and, <laughs> and, and I was off. <laughs> how, how did you feel that day turning in that letter of resignation? Both liberated and terrified at the same time. <laughs> yeah, understandable. Yeah. So you turn in your stuff on the last day. Yeah. You're like, I'm an entrepreneur now. Yes. What did you do? So I actually count uh, my going, hanging up my shingle, if you will, as the day I did a LinkedIn post. And it was August 5th of 2018. So I'm coming up on five years. And I just said, hey, here's my business. <laughs> At that time, I didn't really have a product. I had a little bit of a prototype product. I had zero employees, no no clients, because I, I really didn't start even the, the, the basics of the business until after I left my job. And so the first three months were really around picking myself up off the floor every day, <laughs> telling <laughs> myself it would be okay, and just starting to like send out some emails to some people in my network and see who would have coffee with me and who might give me a chance to try out the idea. After about three months, I got my first paying gig. That's So first win, right, three months in. So you were a mother of four, your family, you're going for three months and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know if this thing is going to work. Yeah, for sure. riveting. Yes. And there were, there were, I'd be scrolling on LinkedIn and I'd see like job opportunities, <laughs> executive director of this nonprofit or P of this in healthcare. And it was so tempting to respond to those in those early days where I'm just like terrified. But, but I remember one day I was, I was dealing with fear management and I just had a moment of just surrendering to the situation <laughs> And just saying, if this is meant to be, like, I'm going to trust that it will be. And if it's not, I'm going to be okay. We will be okay. Mm -hmm. And it was when I truly, like, internally let go Mm -hmm. that the next day a contract landed, right? And then a couple 
like a couple weeks after that, a big contract landed. And when that happened, I got the call. It was in my house from a very large pharmaceutical company. And even though the contract size now would be considered small to Authentics, to me, it was massive. And I went downstairs to the dinner table and I was, kids, mom's going to make it. We're going to make it. Like this major moment for me. So Did I... Uh when you left your previous job, did you have funding secured or was it like full on risk? Like I got to go find customers ASAP. It was all around customers ASAP. I didn't even, people had said, Hey, you're going to raise, raise venture capital. I had no idea what they were talking about. I didn't know that it was going to be a thing for me. I really didn't. It was all about like selling the idea first and using the prototype that I quickly spun up. And I'm glad I took that approach because having some initial revenue helped me make that initial fundraise more successful. But I really, I didn't know what I was doing from a fundraise perspective. I've never done anything like that before. So so, so two questions there, and we'll go down one path first was, you, you're not technical, are you? No, I'm an operations leader. When, yeah. we, when we went through the, the kind of uh, flyover of Authentics, it says machine learning, right? Yeah. How, as a non-technical founder, did you get an MVP that was good enough to sell to, and take on customers? Yeah, really, we didn't start with AI already figured out. We started with what we wanted AI to do. And uh, I brought in a very trusted uh, partner, Michael Armstrong, who's our CTO, who has taught me basically everything I need to know about AI. And what he said is, Amy, if you want good AI, you have to start with training the data. And training the data properly to build a model requires humans who understand how to interpret what's being said in these conversations. And so we spent the first year, we had a, a UI, a piece of software, but all of the, the working with the data was human data labeling. And that's what created the foundation of our AI models that became our machine learning that you hear about So you, today. Were, you were working with AI in like 2018, 2019, before it was cool? Yes, before it was cool, before ChatGPT was a thing, and uh, I'm really proud of how we approached it. We talk about data labeling as a practice. Most companies that use AI do their data labeling um, outside of the U.S. Uh, it's or they to a third party, and it's all about finding as cheap a labor as possible to do data labeling. And for us, it was really important that the AI that we were building was going to be accurate and meaningful for the healthcare sector that we were serving. And so we decided to, and this is very expensive investment, but hire our own team members who are who represent a diverse group of, of human beings who have worked inside the healthcare setting. And so when they're listening to conversations and they're creating tags and labels that eventually turn into our AI models, they're not just being able to understand the words being spoken. They understand the context. They understand the, the, the industry. They understand what patients are actually going through. And so it just makes their work so much higher quality. And so, yeah, that's how we've approached it. Could you give a 10,000 foot flyover of what data labeling and like building an AI model looks like just like 30 seconds of from the top 10,000 feet looking in on that? Yeah. So conversational data is just blah, right? It's like, <laughs> it's all this lines of, of text. When you have a conversation and it gets transcribed, it's just reams and reams of, of, of paragraphs, right? In order to interpret that and to turn that into AI, someone has to categorize and label, oh, this part of the conversation is a, a point of confusion talking about AI. And so it takes a human being to, to do that in a really competent, culturally competent way. And so that's what data labeling is. Wow. It's so important, I think, that uh, people who are building things with AI now understand just how much humanity needs to go into it for those products to actually be effective. Yes. And anyone who has used ChatGPT understands that. Yes. And I would encourage any listener who hasn't gone and tried using ChatGPT, go use it. You'll be amazed in a lot of ways, but also in a lot of ways, oh, okay, yeah, this is not human. Exactly. And, and I would encourage anyone who is considering purchasing AI of, for any sort to ask those software companies how they train their data, because that really matters. And it will help determine the 
the actual ROI that you get from the AI. Quick break from our normal programming. I have Erica Schweier, COO from Elevate Ventures here in the studio today. Erica, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. And you're going to tell us a little bit about this Rally Innovation Conference that's coming up. Yep. So it's the largest cross-sector innovation conference in the world. We're going to feature six innovation studios. So think hard tech, software, sports tech, ag and food, healthcare, and entrepreneurship is going to be our catch-all. I love that. So tell me what is... Who's it for? Yeah, it's for innovators, entrepreneurs, investors. Honestly, anybody probably listening to this podcast. And it's going to be a multi-day thing that's multi-day. happening in downtown Indianapolis. Yep. People coming in from all over the country and maybe even all over the world to be here. That's our hope. Yep. And the dates are actually August 29th through the 31st. Perfect. And if people want to find out more information about speakers, tickets, things like that, where can they go? Yeah. So they just go to rallyinnovation.com and sign up for communications. And they can also get their tickets. I love it. You heard it here at rallyinnovation.com. We'll, we'll see, see you, you there. there. How they train their data. Wow. Speaking of humanity, one of the things that you mentioned in those first three months was just picking yourself up off the floor every day and just going back at it. But you also mentioned this moment of surrender. Mm-hmm. And it seems to me like those are different things. Mm-hmm. But you did both of those in different ways. And I know that probably wasn't the last time you picked yourself up off the floor. If your entrepreneurship journey is like any other entrepreneur's journey that's been on the show. Yeah. How do you balance that? Hey, when do I surrender versus mm. when do I pick myself back up and pump myself up to go at it again? Yeah. My MO, like many entrepreneurs, I think, is we're just so driven to action and a lot of us like control. <laughs> that's why we start our own thing. Uh-huh. And so what I have found is when I tend to be too myopic on my own agenda, I can, it's like I can get the grip of the wheel so tight in my hands. And uh, a lot of times when I'm observant, I'll find that things don't go my way when I, my hands are that tightly gripped. Mm -hmm. And so this is just from living life for decades and decades. I've learned that the times I've experimented with letting go of the grip a little bit, sometimes life starts to go my way a bit more. And so that's usually I I know I need to surrender a bit when I'm feeling super anxious and and tightening up. Um, So those are my clues. Are there any practices that you do that help you kind of clue into those? I've invited lots of feedback into my life and people thankfully hold up a mirror to me a few times every so often to let me know when it appears that I'm like, for example, I was told fairly recently, hey, Amy, we can always tell by your behavior when it's board meeting week. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, thanks for that clue. (laughs) So feedback for sure. And also, I just, I try to be very self-aware, self-examined. I try to meditate uh, pretty frequently, work out, and all those things help me clear my head. Um, In terms of knowing when to pick myself up off the floor, like, Rejection is real. (laughs) And whether you're raising capital, and I've talked to dozens and dozens of uh, VCs who have passed you by or prospective clients, you, you have to find that inner sense of resilience and that sense of self worth. And that's usually, those are the times where I know I need to really be my own self advocate to get myself up again. That's a great perspective. Do you remember your first investor pitch? (laughs) <laughs> I remember, yes, I do. It was actually at a speed dating, VC yes. speed dating event put on by TechPoint, actually. And I remember exactly who it was, who I pitched to. And he was so nice because I couldn't get my iPad to, like I had no. my presentation on the iPad and suddenly it blipped out and of I couldn't course. get it. And he was just like, it's okay, take your time. For two minutes or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> take your time. We got 90 seconds left. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> back up even before that, right? You're a healthcare executive that's transitioning to starting a machine learning AI tech company that didn't know anything about VC. Right. And where did you start there? How did you like find out what venture cap, like what VC stood for? Yeah, I bought the <laughs> book that, and I listened to that while walking on the moon. What, what is the book? Oh, I think it's called Venture Deals. Yes, yeah. Venture yeah. Deals. Yes, exactly. And I also started to tap into my network of folks who had done angel investing. And that's where I just started to learn about it. And those early angel investors that I got to know taught me a lot about it. And I did have a couple of early angel investors, but pretty quickly through introductions, I met some of the indie-based VC 
firms and I got invited to speed dating events and I started just organically learning through baptism by fire. <laughs> yeah. I'll say you just did an audiobook for venture deals. <laughs> That's bold because isn't there like a ton of like tables and numbers? Oh yes, oh, there is. Yes. And I remember listening to them on okay. <laughs> Chapter one. <laughs> oh. Section four. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I love that and I think that speaks a little bit to the tech community throughout Indiana. It's like you start having a few conversations with a couple of angel investors and all of a sudden you're you're messing with your iPad at a, speed, a venture speed dating event. That's pretty cool. It, really cool. And I am blown away by how many seasoned tech executives in this city opened their door to me, didn't have any reason. I was going to do nothing for them. And they were just there to be a source of encouragement. What was the first moment? Like, what was the first, like you're on someone's calendar that's, oh, they know their thing about tech. Who was the first person? Scott McCorkle. Yes. And I couldn't believe that I was getting time with him. I went down to the Salesforce tower where he was at the time and went up to whatever floor. And I was so intimidated um, before I met him and about just the opportunity. And, and he was just so gracious and kind and patient and humble and made me feel like that I was right there with him. And it was, I was blown away. Amazing. What did you learn in that meeting? I learned that Scott was starting a new company, right? And that timing is everything on companies. And I learned that he, while he had so much success that he was going for it again. And the entrepreneurial journey continues. Like there's just startup life is challenging and hard. And I just so respected his humility about the journey itself. And the fact that he just came with no ego about the whole thing. And it really helped me feel relaxed about, you know, where I was at. Amazing. I've, I've had very similar experiences with McCorkle. Not every investor replies to investor updates, and sometimes it's humbling just how few investors reply to investor updates. Yeah. <laughs> but he is one who very frequently be like, hey, I saw this. How you doing? <laughs> and then hopping on a call and just being like, we've all been there. Like, exactly. It's okay. Yeah. I, I will say I've enjoyed relationships with investors and they all come from different perspectives and they're all valuable. I really value investors who have been entrepreneurs because they just get you in a whole different way. Yeah. So it's so great. Yeah, totally agree. Talk about the, that first round of funding because that that's always a pivotal point for every startup. But for Authentics, did it take as long as you thought it was going to take to raise money? Did it take longer than you thought it was going to take to raise money? And what was that kind of like deciding factor that was like, okay, this is, it's go time. Yeah. The deciding factor was I hit a, a point in my, my, my growth with Authentics that I realized I'd seen enough early insights from our initial clients. And I saw enough about what our clients were re reacting, responding to with our product that I could tell we actually had this really cool opportunity to blow it out of the water. I don't think venture raising is for every business. It depends on what your business is. And also if you're trying to grow at a rate that is going to meet the market at a certain time. And I just, I, I came to the conclusion that my particular product and the timing of that, that opportunity was going to be ripe for venture uh, capital. And yep. so that's what kind of led to my decision and in terms of like my expectations, I didn't know what to expect because I had never been through it before. Very humbling experience in those early days. I really had to get comfortable with being having people criticize my idea, force me to think about the business long term, think about go to market strategy, all things that I think I take it for granted that I had it all up in my head and I'd figure it out and I was forced to go through the process. So it was actually really healthy. And it, I don't know how many months it took, uh, probably a good six months or so of pitching and being frustrated and iterating on it. How many pitch decks do you, you know, yeah. per raise do you iterate on? It was so many. Was that a very organic process for you where it was just kind of like it was in your head and you're taking mental notes all along the way and it's okay. This part they really lit up at. So I'm going to put that closer to the beginning of the pitch. And mm -hmm. this, this is where I always lose people. So I'm going to expand or did you take a more methodical approach where it was, okay, debrief after the pitch, writing, writing notes down, changing slides. What does your process look like when you're getting 
that level of feedback and that frequency of feedback? Yeah, I was, I started with a framework that I had read about. Someone gave me a resource, like, here's what your 10 slides should be. Don't go over 10 slides. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Don't go over 10 <laughs> slides. Yeah. Yes. And then with each round of feedback, I would iterate pretty quickly with every round and I would r respond to the feedback I had gotten. I also learned though, to listen to my own voice through that whole process because one person's feedback is one person's feedback, and that doesn't mean that the next investor is going to see it the same way. And so I also learned, oh, everybody has their perspective, and you have to figure out if the feedback you're getting feels authentic enough to actually incorporate it, or if you're just doing it because this investor said to, but then this investor didn't care about that, right? So it's, you learn as you go. Talk to me about authentic and the word authentic and what it means to you and why you decided to include it in the name of your company. Yeah, it started with my decision to leave my corporate career. Um, a big part of my decision wasn't just the problem I wanted to solve, but also the culture I wanted to spend the rest of my working years in. I did some self-examination. I had already turned 40. I was looking back on my career um, right before I left to start Authentics. And I, I realized that I grew up in the corporate world and very much wanted to be successful. And so I looked around me at what it what I thought it took to be successful. And I, over the course of my career, I started to adopt some behaviors, tactics, whatever you want to call it, that looked like I was, like I could compete and win in the environments I was in. But once I got to the stage in my life, I was, I don't really like that about me anymore. I really want to see if I can build something in a more authentic culture. And for me, that meant being less fear-based in my decision-making it meant being always very competitive, but not competitive against other people, instead like with other people. Right. And so Authentics and the name really came from a desire to um, build a culture that allowed everyone to be, be themselves and figure out who they are. And I'm learning that it's not an easy process. There's a lot of unpacking people have to do when they're invited into authenticity and so it's, it continues to be a journey, but it's one we take super seriously. What were some of the things you did early on with the team to try to help foster that culture and community beyond just acting as if yourself and, and showing up authentically? Or maybe we shouldn't just gloss over that because that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, no, it's so much harder than just, hey, be yourself because we... We are products of what we've had to survive, what we'd have to cope through. We all adopt these accessories, if you will, that you have to examine whether or not they're, you really want them anymore. One of the practices that we started at the very early days that we still have is every authenticin is invited to choose a word for the year that represents something that they are working towards or is their beacon for the year. And everybody has an opportunity to share what their word is, why, and then we continue those conversations every quarter with each other um, as an accountability partner, if you will. And I have found that we've had some of the most deep and meaningful conversations as a company in those word sharing sessions. Mm. And it's really, it's a chance to explore who we are in using a word as a, as a point of discussing it. What was your word for the year? This year? Yeah. My word for this year is mirror. Ooh, why is that? Two reasons. One as a verb and one as a noun. Mirror as a noun has all to do with how I look at myself when I, quote, look in the mirror. And I think I have an opportunity to be more inclusive with my own vision of what I see, both the negatives as well as the positives. I think sometimes I tend to focus in one particular area and that doesn't necessarily serve me well. And then as the verb, I think part of my job as a leader today is to help hold up the mirror to others in a way that helps them see what I see or see either the, the blind spots or whatever. And the, sometimes those conversations are like really fun because you're talking about something that's really awesome. And then sometimes those are really hard conversations. And I found that it's harder than I thought to hold up a mirror for someone else. Are you ready to transform your brand with award-winning video content that captures your vision and connects with your audience? Check out Alchemy, the experts at building your brand using video. From story-driven social media snippets that leave a lasting impression to compelling full-length documentaries, they have got the expertise to take your brand to the next level. 
Alchemy is actually our video partner here on Get In, and they do amazing work. All the videos across social, uh, across YouTube, all that is done by Alchemy, and, and they're an amazing partner to work with. Reach out to me, Nate, at Powder Keg, or check out alchemyfilmco.com to get connected with Alden and his team. They will take care of all of your video needs. What are some of the challenges you've faced with the team? Now over 100 people at Authentics, um, amazing. What are some of the challenges you've faced culturally as you've scaled? Yeah, I never thought when I'd finally start my own company that I would do so in an environment where it was like so virtual COVID. And sure. for me, like I'm a very tactical, ta tactile person. So I like to see people. I like to give hugs. I'm told by HR, like, hey, you got to give cool everybody an option. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so developing culture in a virtual or a hybrid environment super hard to do yeah. and so being intentional about connection with people and and all has been a real challenge i think we've done an okay job at it but are still trying to work on it what are some of the things that have worked definitely having points of conversation that are beyond the meetings mm -hmm. beyond the work meetings i i think that having more personal conversation or sharing with each other and creating a space where people can be a little bit vulnerable and share who they are and tell a little bit about their surroundings. Like we have people in all different states. And so just being able to share that part of your life, that's been a really meaningful practice for us. Tactically, how did how do you do that on the team today? Like, because it's hard sometimes, I think, to find that line or know, hey, is this a chit chat conversation or are we getting down to business? And Everyone when do you shift gears? Where it's that first like two minutes of a Zoom, like, where are you from? I'm from Indianapolis. How's the weather there? Oh, it's, <laughs> it's sunny out today. And us Midwesterners could do that for two hours <laughs> if given the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. We actually create space. Like yeah. we say, hey, this particular time is not about work. It's about with this next hour is devoted to talking about our word or it's talking about either a particular event going on and everybody knows coming into that. We also try to use breakout sessions to create smaller, more intimate groups. And then we, we call everybody back to share out. And so we try to create like a virtual coffee shop vibe if we can. It's hard. I know. think that having the word though, that pulls everyone together where it's, I know for our team, it's like, oh, Nate's doing a triathlon and Matt's working on his music. And we know that because we're a small team, but as you grow to over a hundred people, having that one thing of maybe it's risk or maybe it's stability or whatever that might be. And it's, hey, take any risks lately. It might exactly. And that can lead to a really powerful story. And you're like, oh yeah, Dan and HR with skydiving last week. Let's go. <laughs> yes. And I, what you said is so right, because when you select your word and you share it, the whole company is encouraged to ask, how are you doing with that word? Or it, what you just said, have, how have your risk taking been lately? And that is just allows the, the relationships to deepen. I love that so much. Yeah. I'd like to, right, so you talked about your career as a healthcare executive, right? And mm -hmm. wanting to make a change and build this authentic culture. But do you think there were any traits or characteristics from being a healthcare exec that's helped you as a, a tech CEO? Yeah, I think the number one thing, I have lots of disadvantages in that I've never built a tech company before. I didn't know anything about tech, had never raised capital before. But what I did have going for me is I knew the problem firsthand and I knew my customer firsthand because I used to be her. And so the thing that I feel really fortunate about is I was able to use my network and use my knowledge of the market to speak the language of our buyer, know the buyer really well, <clears throat> and um, be able to make sure that what we were building was going to make an actual impact. Is there a, a mentor or a couple of mentors on your path? You mentioned Scott McCorkle, but I'm curious if there are others who have made a particularly meaningful impact in your journey, especially these last couple of years as you've really experienced that hyper growth. Yes. In my early days, one of my earliest angel investor relationships and, and someone that had a lot of experience was um, Bob Bainline. Bob was a part of the acquisition of Aprimo and Teradata, and he taught me so much about VC and venture capital raising. He also really helped me in those moments where I was getting my first term sheets and I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> 
Right. And so there's some soul searching moments where like you're raising capital and, and, and bringing on shareholders for the first time and you have a board for the first time and you have to, there's some humble moments and he was really helpful to me in that. Another one I'd mention is, is also a, a local leader who is now a chief revenue officer at Gregory and Appel. His name is David Fisher. David and I served at, uh, we worked together and uh, he has just been so great, especially on pumping me up for the go to market challenges and has been a, just a great mentor who's always there for me. He gave me a climbing rope. He's a climber and I've rock climbed with him and he gave me this symbolic climbing rope tied in a climbing knot and it's still with me in my office as, hey, I've always got your back. I'll always catch you. And it's just stuff like that that, that has amazing. helped me. I love that. Is there a, you mentioned the book, Venture Deals, yes. and we all know lean startup and hard thing about hard things. And these ones that get named a lot in the like tech and startup world. But I'm curious if there's a, a book or a podcast or even like a music album that has mm. been particularly like impactful for you. Yes. Okay. So first of all, the book thing, the business book thing, I, venture, the Venture Deals was so helpful because it was something brand new. Because I was over 40 and been in so many corporate environments, there wasn't like a particular business um, model that I was drawing to. It was more like an amalgamation of all of those mm -hmm. and just my experience. But music albums, yes. I got introduced to an artist named Trevor Hall, and he's, I think, more popular on the West Coast, but he's making his way Midwest. Anyway, he has an album called The Fruitful Darkness. Mm. Ooh, great and title. Yes. And it's about what you would think it is. It's about every song is about the struggle of when you feel like you, d you cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel. How do you embrace the darkness that you're in? And that came to me, that album came to me in 2019 when I was just getting my legs under me. And it was helpful to me throughout that whole year. Is there a favorite lyric or song that you like from that album? Yeah, so there's a song called What I Know, and the lyric is, what I know is that I don't know. And now I'll dance and I'll sing and I'll live full and I'll give it all to the call of the unknown. And when you're in this time of putting it all out there and we talked about surrender, you have to be okay that you don't know. Absolutely. <laughs> The Fruitful Darkness. Yeah, Fruitful Darkness. Fruitful, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm going to be listening to that one. I haven't heard okay. it. Cool. You should yeah. check it out. Yeah, that's nice. wonderful. Nate, I think it's about that time. I think it is about that time, Matt. All right, Amy, this is our favorite part of the show. Okay. It's called the lightning round. It's Nate's favorite part. I'm it's, nervous. It's my favorite part of the show. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. It's all rapid fire, quick First thing that comes to your mind, there are no wrong answers unless it's the wrong answer. So, <laughs> yes. no, there's absolutely no wrong answers. So, here we go. Outside of the amazing entrepreneurial ecosystem, what is Indiana known for? Corn. <laughs> it's corn. Most oh, popular answer, for that, sure. Uh, corn and basketball. Yeah, corn and basketball. Corn and basketball. All right, we'll take that. What is one hidden gem in Indiana? I got to promote Gosport, Indiana. They have bed races every August. What is a bed race? A bed race is where you take an old hospital bed that has wheels on it and you it's a competition of who can pull the hospital bed down Main Street as fast as possible and it's like a relay type race. It's really fun. I is there someone in the bed yes. while it's happening? Oh, That's yes. amazing. <laughs> We're going to have to find some B-roll footage of that. Some <laughs> bed race B-roll. Yes. And I might need to get a team. Honestly, yeah. that sounds right up my I'm, alley. I'm in. You should. Powder yeah. keg team I'm in bed race. <laughs> well, but, oh my Oh my gosh, yes. Okay. Who is someone that we need to keep on our radar? Someone who is doing big things. So I watched a pitch uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was the co-founder of, it's called Navigate Maternity. No way! That was our last she interview. Was she was what? just in this room. No, yes. She was here less than an hour ago. No oh my way. gosh. She impressed the hell out of me. She went, She spoke right before I did. And I've been following her ever since the geek. I've been like, oh, you're so awesome. And as a mo we're both moms of four kids. Yeah. So just, impressive. Yes. That's fate. Yeah. That is. Plus that's, one on that. Let's yeah, that's go. awesome. Um, so now you got to subscribe to get in if you haven't yeah. already because oh you got to hear her story. 
I gotta, I need to eat Ariana's her after. Amazing. She was, yeah. that was amazing. Two yeah. amazing, oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm, I'm, Serendipity. I'm, I am pumped up right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's awesome. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they did not see each other in the hallway. This was not scripted. I want everyone no, to know that. That's wonderful. Um, I, I do have a couple, one more quick one here. Okay. You're the CEO of a high growth tech company. Where do you go to unwind? Mm. Mm. Or what do you do to unwind? I'll give you either one. Okay. I love a good IPA and I'll oh. go about anywhere to have a good IPA. What's your favorite? I don't know if they're still around, but Indiana City Brewing on the east side of downtown yeah. was my favorite. By the old Angie's List campus? Yes, yeah. I love their IPAs. We used to have our events there. Yes, love those IPAs. And so I love drinking a good beer at the end of the day. And I I love rock climbing and usually I have to leave the, the Indiana area to do that. But I do love Hoosier Heights on the north west side of town ah. to uh, Ooh, I love that to climb on Great yeah shot. Great there shot we though. go amazing this was a spectacular conversation thank you so much for sharing the insights and making like VC venture scaled companies and tech see it's accessible to whether your background's in healthcare whether your background is anything right pick up a couple books talk to some people you can navigate your way there right can absolutely and everybody's experience brings something to the table so that's what i've learned thank you so much for this opportunity it's been great thanks amy congrats on everything we're all ready for you thank you so much this has been get in a powder kick production in partnership with elevate ventures and we want to hear from you if you have suggestions for our guest or segment reach out to matt or nate on linkedin or on email to discover top tier tech companies outside of Silicon Valley in hubs like Indiana, check out our newsletter at powderkeg.com slash newsletter. And to apply for membership to the Powder Keg executive community, check out powderkeg.com slash premium. We'll catch you next time and next week as we continue to help the world get in. Since you just listened to this podcast, you might be thinking about starting one for your company. Lucky for you, our partners over at Casted have you covered. Casted is the first and only podcast and video marketing platform made specifically for B2B brands. I love this about them. The platform makes it possible to publish, syndicate, amplify, and measure the value of your podcast and video content. In fact, we use it for our podcast here at Powder Keg. And if you're a startup, you should listen up because Casted for startups is definitely for you. They are offering exclusive deep discounts of up to 82% off retail price for qualifying startups. Connect with Casted at casted.us slash powderkeg.